William Pitt the Younger, who lived from 1759 to 1806, was to conservative politics what Edmund Burke was to conservative theory. The historian Norman Gash wrote that the world of Burke and Pitt remains as the great uplands from which the headwaters of conservatism descended to the plains of Victorian party politics below. Pitt, the son of an earlier Prime Minister, became Prime Minister himself at the age of 24 and held the post for about 17 consecutive years, from the end of the American Revolutionary War to the middle of the Napoleonic Wars and right through the turbulent years of the French Revolution. He took on the job when the nation had just been humiliated by the Americans and when its future as a great power was in doubt. But his shrewd financial management and his talented leadership soon demonstrated that it, the Britain remained immensely powerful. He built an alliance of conservative European states to combat Napoleon and the threat that revolution would spread across Europe. He also enacted restrictive legislation at home to forestall the possibility that the revolution might spread from France to Britain. He and his followers came to accept Burke's idea that agitation for democracy inside Britain, especially strong in the new industrial towns, was as dangerous to the settled British constitution as Napoleon's threat was from outside. Pitt often referred to himself as an independent Whig and operated in a political world that still lacked party machinery and discipline. Nevertheless, he's probably the one man to whom it's easiest to trace the growth of the British Conservative Party. Well, a combination of strong connections and great political gifts combined to bring Pitt to prominence early in his life. His father had been Prime Minister, notably in 1759, the year of William the Younger's birth, when Britain won overwhelming victories against France in the conflict which is remembered in American history as the French and Indian War and is remembered in British history as the Seven Years' War. This was the conflict in the late 1750s and early 60s in which Britain became the decisive power both in India and in Canada. Uh, the Battle of the Heights of Abraham in 1759, uh, Britain displaced France as the dominant power in Canada. And uh, as he was growing up, young William, who was extremely intellectually gifted, caught the political bug from his father. Now, as a younger son, he wouldn't, in he wouldn't inherit his father's title. One of the hazards of being a politician in one of the British aristocratic families is this. So long as you're, if you're the oldest son, so long as your father is alive, you can take a seat in the House of Commons. But at the time of your father's death, you inherit the title and are forced to go into the House of Lords whether you want to or not. And uh, there have been several occasions in British politics when a, a great career in the House of Commons was cut short because the, uh, the, the politician was forced to go into the House of Lords instead. But because William Pitt was a younger son, this wasn't a hazard he faced. He was elected to Parliament at the age of 21, almost straight after Oxford University, and he became Chancellor of the Exchequer, that is the most senior uh, Treasury position in, uh, in England, the following year. Winning the favour of King George III, he was able to displace Lord North as Premier Prime Minister in December of 1783. Now George III had been King since 1760 and he tried to resume some of the royal prerogatives that his predecessors had lost. Because the British Constitution isn't written, there are many grey areas which, uh, which aren't grey in the American case. Uh, despite the Glorious Revolution and, and despite the accumulation of written law, there's still an unwritten constitution which gave scope for ambiguity, which an ambitious king like George III could hope to fill. Certainly the power of appointments made George III potentially very influential, even if he no longer had the kind of supreme power that some of his ancestors had had. Now, of course, these reforms by George III were one of the reasons that his American subjects were so suspicious of him. Pitt was sometimes at odds with King George III, but he was very careful never to cross him directly because he recognised that this was his patron. A coalition government of Charles James Fox and Lord North, two of the prominent political figures of the, of the day, had a very bad reputation for corruption. And of course, defeat in the American War of Independence had discredited Lord North, who was one of the great villains of American history. After that, George III kept Pitt in office, partly as a way of trying to be sure of keeping Fox out 
Fox therefore depicted Pitt as the king's dupe or creature. And there was an element of truth to that, although Pitt himself had, so, had such great uh, qualities and skills that he was certainly much more than simply the, uh, the king's creature. Now, Pitt, in his first premiership, tried to reform Parliament. This is in 1785. Why? Well, because it no longer adequately represented the population of Britain. I want to emphasise that although Parliament is powerful, it wasn't a democratically elected Parliament. Only about 8 or 10 per cent of the British men had the vote. The vast majority of men and all the women did not have the vote. Now, Britain had changed a lot over the preceding centuries. This is in the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. So now, some of the new industrial towns had no representatives in Parliament at all. On the other hand, this had been a period of rural depopulation. So some areas, some boroughs, had almost no population, but were still served by several members of Parliament. Every election was accompanied with widespread and perfectly open bribery. There was no secret ballot, not until the late 1800s were, did people begin to vote secretly. And that meant that because who you voted for was, was visible, uh, candidates have a very, very high incentive to treat the voters and sometimes to directly pay them money bribes. Now Pitt attempted a mild reform measure, but it failed, partly because too many of the sitting members of Parliament stood to lose their seats from it and therefore didn't want to vote for it. Ironically, Pitt himself had first entered Parliament in one such borough which had hardly any remaining po population, a so-called rotten borough. Parliamentary reform was going to be stalled until the 1830s, another 50 years in the future. And later, Pitt himself turned against it during the crisis of the French Revolutionary Wars. But in the, with the old system, he won two general elections, first in 1784 and again in 1790. And he steadily gained popularity in addition to having the, the sympathetic support of the king. He was liked equally by the country gentlemen, that is the backbone of the old Tories, and also by the merchants whose political power and whose wealth is steadily rising. He radiated a sense of solidity and trustworthiness, even though, strikingly, Pitt was very, very thin in an age when most men in the upper classes were, were fat, Charles James Fox, his great rival, was an enormous man. And, and cartoons of Pitt emphasise his rail-like thinness. Still, he was the most skillful parliamentarian of his day. He was very, very self-disciplined. A cold man, didn't have many friends, never got married. He was very, very self-disciplined never moved to the kinds of rhapsodies which uh, characterised Burke's rhetoric of the type I read to you last time. Uh, except when he knew that uh, grand phrases might pay some dividends in Parliament. He always kept control over his own rhetoric. He was calculating and he was the absolute antithesis of utopian. He had a very, very harsh and realistic view of what the world was really like. I'd like again to quote Norman Gash, who's one of the grand old men of conservative history writing. Gash writes, of Pitt. His integrity of character, his cool, sagacious temperament, his devastating debating skill and unequalled administrative talent enabled him to dominate politics single-handed as no minister had done since Walpole or was to do after him until Peel. In other words, from the early 18th century until the middle of the 19th, there was no one to equal the skill of Pitt the Younger. When he wanted to, he could be eloquent too. The Duchess of Devonshire said, his eloquence was so great, he could explain even every disaster into almost the contrary. His choice of words was perfect, his voice beautiful, and his way of putting aside the question when he chose and fascinating the minds of men, extraordinary. Now he had the insight that lowering taxes might reduce smuggling, one of the great problems of his era, and therefore raise revenue. He was struggling to get the national finances back on a sure footing after the disaster of the American War and the interruption of the transatlantic trade, which only began to resume in the mid and late 1780s. He had this insight. Uh, smuggling is widespread because the duties are so high, and therefore if we make the duties much lower, people will be less willing to take the risks of smuggling it may be that they'll voluntarily obey the, the, the law and therefore revenue will rise. It's the same kind of insight as that which fueled the supply side revolution of the early 1980s in the, the early Reagan government. You, to get more revenue, you don't put taxes up, you put them down because then people have no longer got an incentive to circumvent them.
Throughout his years as Prime Minister, Pitt acted as his own Chancellor of the Exchequer. He probably understood the financial issues of his day better than anyone else. Uh, now, in those days, there was no formal uh, education in economics for aspiring politicians. Most British politicians have always studied the classics and the humanities. It may be that Pitt's only rival in this respect was Gladstone, the great mid-Victorian Prime Minister, and in our own day, Gordon Brown, the man who recently uh, replaced uh, Tony Blair as the Labour Prime Minister, uh, as an expert in economic knowledge. Now, one of the first crises for Pitt came when George III suffered a period of madness. Uh, medical historians have now diagnosed this as probably uh, the uh, affliction of porphyria, but it wasn't, it wasn't recognised in the 1780s, and he was regarded as having gone mad. This was in 1788, on the anniversary of the Glorious Revolution. Pitt nearly lost his position to Fox and the opposing Whig faction which he led. Only the King's recovery saved Pitt's position and gave him a further reminder of the essential character of the King's support. French aggression against Britain forced Pitt to declare war in 1793. Now, in the years between 1789 and 93, everybody in Britain was watching what was happening just across the English Channel very closely and wondering how to respond to it. And there, were, there was a great variety of responses. Many people in the very early days, in 1789, were delighted uh, that the, um, the ancient iniquities of, French, of the French government were being thrown off and the monarchy was being discarded. Hard-headed politicians were delighted in a very different way. That is, France was making itself weak and therefore making itself less of a threat to Britain. All the way through the 1700s, Britain and France had constantly been at war, mainly over um, trade and over uh, imperial colonies. And now suddenly France, because of its revolution, is becoming weaker and therefore is much less of a threat to Britain. On the other hand, it wasn't long before fear of revolution inside Britain began to grow, and in England, a great sympathy for the French aristocracy who were escaping, if they could, from the threat of the guillotine itself in the Reign of Terror of 1793. When the French declared war against Britain, the French revolutionary government also urged the British people to rebel against their own government, further intensifying anxiety in the governing classes that Britain itself might become the victim of another kind of revolution. Pitt worked very hard in the 1790s, building a succession of coalitions against the French Revolution and then against Napoleon. In those days, Britain as a military power was relatively slight. Its armies were small. And so mainly, Pitt's um, alliance building consisted of paying subsidies to Russia and Austria and Prussia, the great anti-Napoleonic monarchies, which they would use to fund armies to fight against the French armies. But Pitt underestimated the power of French nationalism. He underestimated the radiance of the revolutionary idea and the enthusiasm with which many people in France greeted it, especially so long as it was successful. There were very few people in France who were enthusiastic about the idea of having their monarchy restored, especially if the national enemy, Britain, was going to restore it uh, over their heads. So at first, um, anticipated plans for the reinvasion of France and the reinstallation of the monarchy were stillborn. The, uh, the revolutionary forces proved far stronger than Pitt had bargained for. And the French Revolutionary Army, especially once Napoleon became the dominant figure in it, enjoyed an astonishing succession of victories in the 1790s, dominating Europe and forcing even the great monarchies to come to terms in a way they've, which for them was unprecedented and humiliating. Pitt had underestimated the radiance of the revolutionary idea, and perhaps that's a common conservative shortcoming through history. Uh, conservatives are so horrified by revolution, they sometimes find it difficult to believe that other people can be so deeply attracted by it. Certainly Pitt failed to foresee the length of the war and the need to mobilise the entire nation. Really, in the end, for more than 20 years, they were almost constantly at war. The bright spot of the war, from the point of view of the British, was the success of the British Navy, which has always been the senior service in British military history. Horatio Nelson, Britain's most famous naval hero, won a succession of, of victories over the French fleets and to some extent offset these defeats on land uh, suffered by Britain's allies. And uh, Nelson and other English admirals were able to take over French colonies, particularly in the Caribbean, although their garrisons died there of yellow fever and malaria in terrifying numbers.
When the second coalition which Pitt had organised, comprising of Russia, Prussia and Austria, failed and when its members came to terms with Napoleon, Pitt resolved to fight on alone against France. And here there's a premonition of Winston Churchill in 1940, uh, who was determined, whatever happened to his allies, to fight on alone against the Nazi threat. Pitt was like Churchill in the sense that nearly everybody in the political nation, that is the minority of people who are politically involved and active, agreed that he was the best man in the country for the job of the great French wars. But just as there were many desperate moments in uh, Churchill's uh, years in, in Downing Street in 1940 and 41, so there were many desperate times in Pitt's administration, by now the mythology has covered up how close Britain did in fact come to being defeated. He was out of office between 1801 and 1803, uh, but once the war against France resumed, he was recalled to office because he was still regarded as the man of the hour, the man best able to lead Britain in its great crisis. Meanwhile, uh, a, a crisis in Irish politics almost um, destroyed Pitt. Many, many people in British, British political history have found Ireland to be the graveyard of their hopes and ambitions. An Irish uprising in 1798 prompted him to incorporate Ireland into the United Kingdom. Until that time it had been excluded. Now the situation in Ireland is complicated and although I can tell you some of it here, uh, much more could certainly be, be said. The majority of the people living in Ireland were Catholics and they were totally excluded because of their religion from political life, from being magistrates, from being army officers, uh, and from sitting in parliamentary seats. Most of the Catholics were grindingly poor peasants, but even the wealthier Catholic minority were themselves um, systematically discriminated against in political life. The Protestant minority in Ireland were descended from um, 17th century uh, Protestant migrants from England and Scotland who'd gone to Ireland, uh, particularly to the six counties of Ulster in the north, first under James I and then in the era of Oliver Cromwell and the English Revolutionary Wars. There was a very, very high degree of Protestant Catholic tension between the religious, the Protestant minority who had most of the power and the Catholic majority who were numerically dominant. But also in the 1790s, among a minority, particularly the educated minority in Ireland, was a growing and shared sense of nationalism, led by a Protestant leader called Wolf Tone and a Catholic named Napper Tandy. They also were enthusiasts for what was happening in France and enthusiastic readers of Thomas Paine. They struggled, not very successfully, to try to wean some of the Catholic peasant majority away from their principal loyalty, which was to the Catholic Church. Here's a declaration of some of the Belfast radicals, Belfast a town in Northern Ireland, where locally there's a Protestant majority. That the weight of English influence in the government of this country is so great as to require a cordial union among all the people of Ireland. No reform is practicable, efficacious or just, which does not include Irishmen of every religious persuasion. Well, that was the hope, to overcome the sectarian differences and unite Ireland in favour of the idea of Irish nationalism. Well, Pitt characteristically support, strongly supported the, Catholic, the, the, the Protestant minority, but he did understand that it was politically shrewd and perhaps even ethically necessary eventually to give some kind of relief to the Catholics as well. There's always the danger when England was at war against France that French armies might invade Ireland and attack Britain from two sides, uh, from Ireland and from France. And in 1798, French aid to the Irish, an army of 14,000 men, made 1798 a moment of supreme danger, comparable to the Boyne campaign of 1690, when William III, William of Orange, after coming to become King of England, had then fought against a French and Irish army in the Battle of the Boyne. After the defeat of the 1798 Rising, Pitt decided to incorporate Ireland into the United Kingdom and uh, Parliament, with his enthusiastic support, passed the Act of Union. The independent Irish Parliament was dissolved. A hundred new seats for Irish Members of Parliament was created in the London House of Commons and 28 new seats were created in the House of Lords.
But then there was the question of religion. Pitt favoured Catholic emancipation, that is, lifting the civil disadvantages which were imposed upon people because they were Catholics. He said this is the only way of incorporating more of the people of Ireland into sympathetic support of, of the United Kingdom. This is a sign that Pitt wasn't always against reforms, even during the Napoleonic Wars. That is, he could see practical benefits, and perhaps even a desirable ethical outcome, from reforms. But the king hated it. The king was totally opposed to, to Catholic emancipation. He said it violated his oath of office, that in becoming king of England, he'd promised to uphold the Church of England, and that meant um, constant, uh, uncompromising opposition to Catholicism. He threatened to veto legislation were it to be brought to the, to the point, the last time ever in British history that the monarch has threatened to veto legislation. And it was over this issue that Pitt finally was forced out of office in 1801 because of this breach with the king. Well now, in domestic politics, Pitt represents the strong government end of the conservative spectrum. As I mentioned in the first lecture, sometimes conservatives favour strong government, and sometimes they favour weak government. Pitt's certainly at the strong end of the spectrum. And this is because he was so afraid <clears throat> that the revolutionary, contagion might, the re revolutionary contagion might spread from France to England, and that therefore he thought it was appropriate to repress signs of potentially revolutionary activity in England. In the 1790s, he came to share Edmund Burke's judgment about the threat posed by revolution. He'd scoffed at Burke, calling him an alarmist back in 1790 and 91, but he began to agree with Burke's analysis as the chaos in France worsened. The situation was complicated by the fact that these were the early stages of the Industrial Revolution, creating new concentrations of population, which as I mentioned were not politically represented and which potentially seemed uh, politically unstable. It was in the French cities, particularly Paris, that the mob was most threatening, and British politicians had a lively awareness that the same kind of concentrated poor populations in the English cities might also become revolutionary in the same way. I think it's possible to argue that conservatism is a post-industrial revolution phenomenon, which asks the question, how do we deal with politics in, in countries full of large cities where concentrated working populations live? And as they gradually become educated and gradually become dissatisfied, that's one of the great problems. A closely related one is, how do you treat the capitalists, who are also a new type of people, who are very often also dissatisfied with concentrations of power among the landed elite? There was certainly a bitter sense of, of unfairness and of, of, of undeserved exclusion on the part of many of the new industrialists. Now, many of the new industrialists were not members of the Church of England. They were nonconformists. Now, nonconformist is the word which means that they were Baptists or Quakers or Presbyterians or Congregationalists or Methodists. That is, members of churches which were not part of the Church of England. They didn't conform to the Church of England, so they were nonconformists or dissenters. And they were excluded from many of the benefits of political life, and they were kept out of the old universities, Oxford and Cambridge, because you had to be an Anglican to go. The early history of English industrialization is mainly the history of uh, nonconformists. The Derby family of ironsmiths in Colebrookdale, where the first people ever to build an iron bridge, were Quakers. James Watt, the man who effectively made steam engines uh, efficient and small enough for a lot of industrial purposes, was a Presbyterian. Josiah Wedgwood, the pottery maker, was a dissenter as well. He was Charles Darwin's grandfather. Now, all these people tended to be enthusiastic about the American Revolution and then to be enthusiastic about the French Revolution. In some cases, they came from extremely poor families. Richard Arkwright, who made a great fortune as one of the, great, the first great textile barons in English history, came from a poor, excluded family. This is a, where, where we have to exercise our historical imaginations. We're used to the idea that the leaders of the business community will be conservatives. But in the late 18th century, they often seem to be as much of a threat as a support to the guardians of society, offering the challenge of a new form of wealth in a society that had always been dominated by the landowners. Only much later did the business community come to seem intrinsically conservative. Well, it was in, under Pitt's government that sedition laws began to restrict freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. Artisans groups advocating democracy sprang up in reaction to the French Revolution, 
corresponding societies whose literate members wrote to each other and to partner groups in France about what was happening in, uh, in the revolution. Their favourite author was Tom Paine, whose Rights of Man in 1792 was such an important uh, text. And as I mentioned before in talking about Paine's answer to Burke, Paine argued not on the traditional rights of Englishmen, but on the natural rights of man. Paine denounced all forms of hereditary privilege, including monarchy and aristocracy. He favoured free education for all, family allowances and pensions for the elderly, and a system of meritocracy that by your virtues you should rise rather than by your heredity. Nearly all these ideas seem very, very reasonable now, but were explosively radical then. Having once been a reformer, Pitt now saw parliamentary reform as an incitement to democracy and radicalism, and for him democracy was a very, very negative concept. Pitt depicted democracy and radicalism as forms of disloyalty and in effect lost all interest in being a reformer. His view was government should be for the people, but it should not be by the people. One of the things that's difficult for us to understand, especially when we're studying the politics of 200 years ago, is this, that nearly everybody assumed the naturalness of human inequality. I dare say many of us think that human equality is natural, but then we've got to look at the fact that historically hardly any societies over the long history of the world have believed in human equality. It's a very, very unusual belief. We're the strange ones in believing in equality. And Pitt was on very, very firm and familiar ground in arguing on behalf of human inequality. Well, in 1794 and again in 1798, Pitt guided legislation through Parliament to suspend habeas corpus. It permitted the government to hold indefinitely men who were suspected of radical activity. There was no need to bring them to trial on publicly declared charges. He also created networks of domestic spies. This was at a time when the, the government's executive was still very weak and was dependent on cooperative gentlemen in the provinces who were the local magistrates and whose cooperation was necessary for the laws to be enforced. Pitt also introduced the Seditious Meetings and Treasonable Practices Act of 1795, which specified that political meetings could only be called with the express authorization of a magistrate. Now, at the same time, his government was busy coming up with um, patriotic activities to interest the lower classes. Patriotic societies, which would uh, drill, create local militias, getting ready for the possibility of a French invasion. And in them was uh, whipped up an enthusiastic um, national enthusiasm and a hatred of France as a counterpart to these revolutionary ideas. And patriotic societies were popular among the, the poor working people as well. It's important to emphasise that so-called small C conservatism, that is conservatism quite apart from the Conservative Party, has always been popular uh, in England. It's always been very strong among the British lower classes, which share the idea of hierarchy and place. You mustn't imagine that only the aristocracy believed in inequality. You'll often find throughout British history, all the way up and down the social scale, people who agree with the idea of human inequality and have the idea that there's a ladder and that everyone's got their place on that ladder with duties to those above them and responsibilities to those below them. Well, British radical groups certainly did suffer and were persecuted, but Britain never faced anything remotely like the revolutionary terror. Some people were imprisoned, but there were no arbitrary killings. So it's necessary to make a balanced judgment about the way in which uh, political life proceeded. Certainly Pitt also in, in, um, in employed a lot of propagandists who argued the case against revolution and upheaval. And uh, John Bull, who's the, the personification of British common sense, John Bull's the kind of counterpart to Uncle Sam, the person who represents the goodwill and good sense of the nation. He's one of the prominent figures in this uh, propaganda. Every time the Royal Navy won a great victory, there'd be a patriotic procession for the people to join in. This is a, an augury of Disraeli's jingoism a century later. The Combination Acts of 1799 and 1800 prohibited all forms of trade unionism. Pitt was starting to agree with the industrialists that meetings of disgruntled working men were potentially harmful to political stability. They're remembered by trade unionists and by the Labour Party right up to the present as the darkest hour of British trade union history, where the government systematically discriminated against trade unions. Well, Pitt's brief period out of office coincided with a piece of Amiens, a, 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 in effect a truce in the Napoleonic Wars. 
He was a friend of Henry Addington, who succeeded him. But Addington, who was, uh, um, well, Addington's nickname was The Doctor. Uh, his father had been a doctor, and that was meant to be an insult. We wouldn't regard being called the doctor as an insult, but, it, but they certainly did in, in those days. In other words, he wasn't a man who came from the aristocracy. He was regarded as a lightweight, and public opinion was quite clear that when the wars against Napoleon resumed, Pitt must return. Even the king thought so. So George III recalled Pitt in the same week that Napoleon declared himself the emperor of the French. The fighting resumed. And Pitt resumed the struggle against France and the search for allies in Europe. He died prematurely, aged only 46, uh, from gout and from heavy drinking, two of the characteristic ailments of the age. Just after a catastrophic defeat for his allies at the Battle of Austerlitz, mitigated only by Nelson's greatest and last victory at sea, Trafalgar, uh, when he died on the, flagship of his own, uh, on the deck of his own flagship, HMS Victory. Well, Pitt had led Britain in a period we now know to have avoided revolution. But just because it's clear to us now that there wasn't a French Revolution in England, it's necessary for us to remember, as we try to understand Pitt, that the fear that there might be a revolution then seemed very, very real indeed. Just because something didn't happen in history doesn't mean that it was bound not to.